Hello, everybody out there, and welcome to our Inside Talc Live webinar. Webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We really wish we could be on the road with you right now, reveling in this awe-inspiring scenery that is our American Canyonlands, but we'll just have to practice a little patience. Um, a couple pieces of housekeeping before we get started here. Uh, closed captioning is available. Please click on the CC icon that you see at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitle. Uh, we will allow for a brief Q&A session after the presentation, so please submit your questions as they come to mind using the chat feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to the questions um, with, that, you're, that you want to uh, mention to us, just go ahead and email insidetalk at talk.com. Now, allow me to do a brief introduction of our speaker this afternoon, Mr. Don Dunkel. Don Dunkel has been adventuring with Tauk guests for 35 years with a degree in botany. He's curated a unique perspective and enthusiasm for the world's natural landscapes. His style is one that we know you'll enjoy. We're so excited to share him with all of you. Go ahead, Don, take it away. Yes, hello and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, I look forward to sharing with you some of the glories and the wonders, which is this, the, uh, the desert Southwest. Uh, the third itinerary that I learned going back to 1987 was in the Canadian Rockies. And uh, as I got there, uh, all of the established tour directors there were advising me to get a book uh, called The Handbook of the Canadian Rockies by Ben Gadd. So as I did so and was kind of leafing through this, uh, a couple of revelations on my side. One is that uh, mountains had names. Uh, the next that they were made or composed of something and that they can be dated. So this began an inquiry of mine, which has lasted from 1987 and certainly uh, uh, through uh, today. And uh, so to kind of get started, we're going to uh, have a little bit of a, a, a photograph here. And um, it is of what is called Mount Kirkeslin. And as we see Mount Kirkeslin, um, the, it looks like a mountain, okay, so again, here's the name. The next is it's made of things, and right up about at the very, very top of it, where you see that little bit of snow, uh, is made of limestone, and limestone is a deposit in the bottom of an ocean, but most of the bottom tree part is made of quartzite, so if, you, if sand becomes compressed, it becomes sandstone, and if it becomes compressed again really, really tightly, it becomes known as quartzite. And so the timeline of these is at the very top of the limestone is Devonian. And just for the ease of things, let's put it at 400 million years ago, it was at the bottom of an ocean that was accumulating the material from dead, uh, decaying marine organisms. And the bottom, which is going to be the older of the rocks, uh, is, is actually uh, from the Cambrian period. And let's date that at 500 million years old. I'm just rounding things off to the tens of millions of years. So I know some of you at home right now are like rolling your eyes, uh, thinking, well, uh, how can there be Devonian and Cambrian? So you're thinking, well, what, what happened to the uh, Silurian rocks and the uh, Ordovician? And so those were uh, periods of uh, either erosion or lack of deposition. You'll hear that kind of term again as we kind of carry on towards the desert southwest in just a little bit. And so sometimes that happens. There's deposits, deposits, and then there's, uh, the tops are stripped away. This is what is called an unconformity. So just about where the trees end and where the, the top uh, kind of begins is an unconformity, surprisingly, of plus or minus, again, about 100 million years. And so everything that is down below uh, was the very, very first evidence of fossils as far as geologists go. And I do want to let you know, this is not geology. Geology is for geologists. You know, this is really not what it is. But it did begin my kind of, my, my, uh, my interest uh, in, in rocks. So the only fossil evidence of anything that was alive uh, below ground of where I was standing when I took this photo uh, are called stromatolites. And they go back an additional three billion years from, from, from this time. And I don't know if you've actually seen a stromatolite. I really don't have one to show you live, but I just happen to have one as a fossil. 
I don't know if you can see that there are little lines that are kind of, kind of going through here. But the thing about this dramatolite in the very, very earliest forms of life is that they were the ones who, first of all, had the first ability to photosynthesize. We all know that the offset of, of, of that is oxygen. So without these little critters that lived in the shallow seas, there would not be the oxygen uh, available for uh, life uh, kind of in the future. So we have to give some absolute credence uh, to, uh, to them for sure. So this is not geology, it's physical geography is what it is. And what I have found uh, quite uh, wonderful is what is called the rock cycle. And that is how materials are made, how they're uplifted and how they're degraded, otherwise known as mass wasting. So if anything, you can actually say that I'm in, in Mount, in, in, into Mount West, uh, mass wasting. So now I have the cursor. You might see the cursor right about in the very, very middle of it. And I'm gonna start at the top of Mount Kirkeslin and see uh, what we can investigate just by this one photo that I wish that we would be able to show you in person. But the fact that there's any snow on there implies that it's really late in the uh, middle of the summer, quite likely. And this would be a relatively north facing slope. Uh, everything on the other side of the mountain has already been melted away uh, months ago. The other thing that I would kind of like to show you is that see there seems to be some horizontal lines. And this is evidence of one of the three different types of rock. This is called sedimentary rock. And if you follow my cursor, you can kind of see that it is going up on the end, and then it's kind of bowed down uh, there in the middle. And, and this is just a process of the uplift. So when this whole thing was lifted up, uh, the sides lifted up a little bit further and bent or showed plasticity in this little bit of rock. So now let's go down through the limestone layers, and here's our unconformity just here. And uh, so now we get into the trees. Uh, the trees that we see uh, on the, uh, where my cursor is in the middle are the same as the trees that you see on one side here or the other. And these are spruces and firs and, and, and pines. But the color of it is not something in the photography, but instead uh, is a blight. And any of you that live in the West uh, or have traveled in the West have seen literally millions of acres in Canada, Western Canada, Western United States that have been hit by a naturally occurring what is called pine beetle or pine bark beetle. So uh, they will kill in one generation, and then the uh, eggs are laid to then mature to adults that go to the next trees over and is really killing millions and millions of acres. And so moving on down here, uh, this is a very classic uh, destination for just about anybody who uh, is in this area, and this is what is called Athabasca Falls. And Athabasca Falls, the, the actual source of it is not too far off the right-hand side of the of the photo, you know, maybe 18, 25 miles. And what that is, is, is a, um, uh, an ice field. And this ice field is an accumulation of uh, snow, uh, which has then been created into glacial ice in these outlet uh, kind of tongues. And one of those tongues, the Athabasca Glacier, is part of the Talc Tour to go up there on a snow coach. So after that Athabasca Glacier melts, it is the source of what we see here. And as it kind of kind of tumbles on down here, it continues another 2,500 miles all the way to the Arctic. Now, 2,500 miles is one thing, but it's even further in kilometers, seeing that we are indeed in Canada. And the color of the water, which is hard to see because of the churning of the waterfall, is really hard to see, but there's pulverized material uh, from that glacier stuff called glacial flower. And that works as an abrasive as it kind of tumbles here uh, over the falls. And the fact that there's any waterfalls at all is another implication. Hard rock resists erosion. So the rock right here at the middle happens to be just a little harder than the rock just down just a little bit further. Now let's go right to the top of the falls and you can kind of see a straight line. And if we were to go off the left side of the straight line, um, not all that far is the town of Jasper, Alberta, Canada, where Talc stays at Jasper Park Lodge, an incredible uh, property for sure. If we were to continue down to the right past the ice fields, um, we'd go down to the Trans-Canada Highway and then the other two marquee properties that we have there, which is going to be uh, the um, uh, Chateau Lake Louise and uh, the Bam Springs Hotel. So uh, again, there's just really an awful lot more in that than isn't that a kind of a, a pretty waterfall, I guess is what I'm saying. And so uh, with that uh, now, I should be full screen. 
And now to kind of come down to what I am going to keynote here, and that is the highlights of uh, the, uh, a, a, an incredible landscape in an arid environment. And the tour company that I've been blessed to uh, have worked with, uh, Talc, uh, Talc Tours, Talc World Discovery, um, is really kind of a, a name. And that name uh, started really quite humbly by Arthur Talc Sr. Uh, in uh, 1925. And he first offered a seven day tour, $7 a day to go through New England, everything kind of included. And in 1958, uh, his, um, his son, Arthur Jr., uh, took the helm. And what Arthur Jr. did is took us behind um, and beyond all uh, the horizons here. Um, and now, Talc Tours, we are really beyond all horizons. But it's Arthur uh, Sr. Uh, that I think all of us uh, kind of carry as a, as a legacy, let's say, today. So with that, let me go ahead and, and take a screenshot here and, and pull up the first uh, photo here. And um, just, okay. And so, oh my gosh. Um, and there he is. There's Arthur Tux Sr. Uh, from a very famous internal photograph of, of him. And as I look around this particular photo, this is the beginning of what, a tour we call America's Canyon Lands. And I think something that's really kind of dominating beside Arthur Sr. Uh, is this large cactus in the middle. And that's what's known as a saguaro cactus, and that's spelled S-A-G-U-A-R-O, saguaro. And if you see this in film, if you see this uh, on, uh, on your TV at home, you know that this has to be the Sonoran Desert, which is obviously where we are. Because the other three deserts that we have in the United States, there is no, um, uh, there is no saguaro cactus naturally occurring in the Chihuahuan Desert, the Great Basin, uh, or the Mojave. And it's pretty amazing that this thing is so erect, as is the one a little further back there, considering they're made up of 98% by water. And the little, little things you see on the tips of some of these arms um, are actually just the beginnings uh, of the flowers, which will then uh, open up, be pollinated by a bat that comes up from Mexico, produce a beautiful fruit, and that's what will kind of perpetuate it. Now behind Arthur Sr. Uh, and by the saguaro uh, is uh, uh, our state tree, and it comes from the, the uh, the uh, Spanish name, a green stick or Palo Verde, and those yellows are really just the blossoms. Now at the bottom of the saguaro uh, there uh, is some green stuff, and uh, the, some of you may know this of interest, it's called jajoba. And after all the sperm whales were such that they were not being able to found to produce lubricating oil, jajoba, not ground up, produced the best lubricating oil in the world until synthetics in the Second World War. Now down in the kind of the bottom left there, there's kind of an assemblage of cactus. And these cactus are known as choyas, C-H-O-O-L-L-A. And you know what? I've never been pricked uh, by the thorn of a choya. I've never been pricked by a thorn of a saguaro. The reason why is they don't have thorns. Roses have thorns. And a thorn is something that's sharp that comes out of the stalk of it, whereas these are actually modified leaves. So these are actually called spines. When it comes to spines, yesterday I did a volunteer project out in the desert. I got me a couple of spines uh, from a saguaro just there. And last, let's kind of look at these buildings. And you know, in Spanish, any word that ends in an ITA is a diminutive, meaning small. So these are known as casitas or small houses. And this is where the top tours stay at a, just a really a quite wonderful beginning of the America's Canyonlands itinerary. And it's a great hotel, and actually it's a, a, a great group of hotels uh, known as the Four Seasons. So uh, let's see if Arthur will kind of come along with us here as we make our way uh, towards uh, Las Vegas. Oh, there's Arthur Senior again, and he's enjoying the fact that he is getting close to Sedona, Arizona. And as one looks towards the background there, there's a rock that's called, uh, that looks like a bell. And actually, it's called, it's called Bell Rock. 
And this will give me a pretty good opportunity to really highlight that most of the landscape that we see is one of three different types of rock. And the first type is called igneous, or from the Greek for fire. And the way that we classify igneous rock is uh, on two categories. One are relative amounts of silica to iron, more or less of one or to the other. And the other is the speed of cooling. And so just a couple of examples without explanation would be basalt and granite. Whereas what we're looking at here is called sedimentary rock. And, and, and sedimentary rock always has come from some parent rock, some other place, and is degraded by wind and water and time and then transported and then put down in great layers known as sediments. And because of the compression of the material above it, along with the binding material found within the sediment, it, 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 it coalesces, it becomes a new rock. And uh, there are many examples, and I'll spare you the explanations, but things such as siltstones, claystones, uh, shale, um, uh, limestones, conglomerates, these are all examples of it. And so the material that you're looking here out of Bell Rock uh, came from a really a great distance away. And when I'm doing the tour, and we're actually coming up towards Bell Rock, inevitably someone might say to me, a very, very pointed question will say, Don, why the rock wed? Well, the reason that they're red is because the parent rock from which this was degraded had hematite, Fe203. Uh, and, 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 and as long as the hematite is bound in that parent rock, it's very stable. But when it erodes out, it's like a tour director I know, very, very unstable. And as it uh, kind of makes its way kind of out and is brought here actually by water, uh, that hematite that is in there uh, mixes with the water and creates something we commonly call rust. So when we have molecular rust, along with the sediments, makes red sediments, which then makes red rock. And uh, just kind of keep an eye on this. This is what is called Bell Rock, and part of what is known as the Schneebly Hill Formation. Sedona Schneebly was one of the early pioneers, going back to the very uh, earliest kind of uh, 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 1900s uh, there. And... Um, the other kind of an idea that is to be consistent that I think it's well worth recognizing is what uh, Kelly, you know, Kelly who introduced us, we were talking a little earlier and she was reminding me of something that I think is worth uh, realizing and that's called the law of superposition. And that is in sedimentary layering, unless there is something during the upheaval, uh, the oldest rocks are the ones on the bottom. So the lowest sediments, then higher and higher and higher. So we can uh, note then that looking at Bell Rock, the stuff on the bottom it could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, uh, than that up there uh, on the top. And so this is all done during what is called the Paleozoic, uh, during the Permian, the last of the Paleozoic, uh, about 270 million years. I think it was June or July. I think it was just about midsummer when all that was deposited. The other thing I want to let you know about Bell Rock and the Schnebel Hill Formation is the rock group that is below it is found in the Grand Canyon. The rock group that is above it that has been eroded away is in the Grand Canyon. But in the Grand Canyon, there's no uh, Schnebel Hill Formation. Now, notice that our kind of Sonoran Desert landscape has kind of gone away, and we're seeing some other things. Here on the left side of Arthur Sr., as you're looking at him here, uh, is uh, mesquite, and I know you know of uh, mesquite uh, trees there. Uh, they're very, very weedy trees uh, with the introduction of cattle grazing. We have many, many mesquites here. And right there in the middle of the photo, uh, these are different types of junipers. We have two uh, kind of arid junipers available there. So uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Oh, there's Arthur coming. Uh, he might be kind of staying with us here. This is Arthur uh, Todd Jr. and he's enjoying the Grand Canyon. And so um, he is standing on a light colored rock. And that rock used to be an ocean bottom uh, seven, uh, 245 million years ago. So what kind of forces do you imagine are involved when something is below the ocean, on the bottom of an ocean, a quiet deep ocean, and now it is at uh, about 7,800 7, feet above sea level. So this is all part of the great uplift which created all these mountain ranges in the West uh, known as Laramide Orogeny. And uh, it had uh, started about uh, 70 million years ago. And so uh, kind of think of it this way. The rock is really old. The uplift that created the plateau is really old. 
but the actual uh, carving in the Grand Canyon, which was done most exclusively by water, is relatively young geologically, only in about the last six and a half billion years. So if, if we use the law of superposition, uh, we can really uh, go ahead and imply that the uh, youngest rocks are right there on the top. And as it gets down into where the Colorado River is, which you can kind of see by cursor, the river is running kind of from right to left there, uh, is going to be the oldest rock. And at least visible, you know, the only rock that, that was laid as a sediment that was not done by water, not done by water, is this little light stuff here, right there off of Arthur uh, Senior's elbow. Now, I can't see it across uh, the canyon there. That's called the North Rim. If I look at that little streak there, that's kind of the same as this. And this is what is called the Coconino Sandstone, a 1,700 square mile uh, desert, you know? And this was uh, you know, a very, very, very large uh, mass uh, here. And what's below it there uh, is what is called the Hermit Shale. And this, the reason I, I uh, you know, implore you to employ you to recognize this is, you know, Bell Rock and the Sedona uh, 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 Schnebly Hill Formation it down there is tucked right between the Coconino uh, and the Hermit Shale. So the, uh, the other I'd like to recognize is the fact that uh, there, it seems relatively flat here. And the reason it's flat has to do with the same thing that Arthur's standing on. And this is what is known as the Kaibab limestone. And the one thing about it is uh, when the uplift occurred, 70 million and subsequently millions uh, you know, since then, there had quite possibly been another mile of vertical sedimentary rock above us. And through this geologic time, uh, uh, much of it has eroded away. So why didn't the, uh, it erode any deeper than where we are standing and this flat horizon has to do with the composition of limestone. As long as limestone is flat lying and um, in an arid environment, it's a very good cap rock. So imagine everything above us where the blue sky is eroding, eroding, eroding down, and then it just kind of stopped really just, uh, just there. So let's move on from the Grand Canyon, uh, which again is all, all of the, it is in Arizona. And oh, there's Arthur Sr. again. He's enjoying himself having a look at a little bit of wildlife. And so this uh, wildlife here uh, is uh, commonly called an elk. The, the duck would be the incorrect nomenclature here. Uh, it is actually what is called a wapiti. Up in Canada, they call it a wapiti but uh, that would be the correct thing. And translated to English uh, from the Shawnee tribe, it means white rump. So let's uh, look closely at the animal and look at its rear end. And even see from that, you can see that it's kind of got a really light patch on it. And uh, this patch uh, is one of the easy ways to show that this is a wapiti as opposed to uh, that of a deer, although they are in a deer family, this is a larger animal. But if we were to look at the extended neck, uh, there is some dark hair on the nape on the back, and then some longish hair around uh, kind of there in the front of its neck, uh, so to speak. And that is also a, an easy way to identify that. And because it's a member of the Cervidae family, which is the deer, so deer, wapiti, moose, caribou, uh, those kind of a mob, um, the way that we identify the genders here, uh, the male would be the bull, she's a cow, and then the, the calf would be the young. And before we got on here today, I tried to uh, recognize, see her stomach looks a little distended to me, uh, but looking at the vegetation, it just doesn't appear to be in a spring green up. So I'm either not reading that correctly, uh, or she is a cow uh, without calf meaning, uh, or maybe she's just like a heifer having never, um, well, never mind uh, there. Um, now, the uh, interesting uh, thing also about the uh, Cervidae family uh, is the fact that the guys uh, have antlers. And there has been a very, very big discussion um, and a lot of uh, a misuse of the term between that and horns. And so it, to kind of clear that up a little bit, what an antler is, uh, is bore uh, as part of the skull of the animal and is bore by males only with one exception in nature there's so many times there's exceptions and that would be the caribou uh, both the male and female uh, do have the antler 
The other thing is that they are born in the spring and then they develop and they are branched and they are made of bony material and uh, uh, the, they are solid and um, then they are cast off sometime in the autumn uh, through the winter time. So I just happened to go in my backyard where I had picked up uh, that of an antler. Okay, so you can kind of see this is from a mule deer here. See, so one of two, so that came right out of the skull and this is, this is cast off every year. Whereas the family of animals, which is known as um, bovidae, the bovines, they have horns. So the kind of general description of a horn is it's bore by both sexes, held for life, is hollow, unbranched, and uh, is made of the same thing as your fingernail, which is called keratin. Now I have a very, very novel, uh, very novel uh, horn here. Uh, but uh, see this gelatinous kind of material of the horn, and then there's kind of like a fused hair. The thing is, this comes from an animal like no other in the world. And it's uh, technically called the American pronghorn, but you may know it is uh, from the very popular song, it's called the antelope, all going all the way back to Lewis and Clark. And so uh, the interesting thing about this particular horn, is this is the only animal in the world that I know of, and I could be corrected on this, but this is, uh, this is as, as I'm comfortable as saying as much. Uh, this is the only animal in the world where uh, the, both males and females have horns that are shed annually. Remember, otherwise horns are held for life. And uh, what makes it the pronghorn is this annual horn of the male, uh, you see has this little anterior hook on it uh, known as uh, uh, the prong there. So uh, moving on to the next slide, let me get my cursor here and here we go. Oh, there's Arthur. He's enjoying a rare opportunity to stand above something that is really, really well known uh, here in the American West. And it's very important because this is the key storage unit of the Colorado River Basin. Uh, the construction of this by the United States Bureau of Reclamation uh, went back from 1956 to 63, and it's called the Glen Canyon Dam. Glen Canyon extends many miles to the left following upriver there where the water is and another 15 miles uh, downriver uh, from uh, the base of the dam. You might note uh, there on the very, very top, there's two large columns. These are elevators um, that will go down into the dam, just like uh, being a caver. You don't want to have one way in and one way out of a cave. You don't want to have only one way in and one way out to, of something such as this, because this is a massive structure, everyone. It's 583 feet above the old water line, and, and dams have to go down well below the former water line of the Colorado River. And the curving crest, you can kind of see it kind of rolling around there, is, is a little under a third of a mile, 1,560 feet. And, and that doesn't take into account that it's dug way into the sides of the canyon also. Uh, and that's for stability. Uh, the explanation for the curving crest, as you see there, is because it's so hard and so big, the only way that the, the great pressure of the water could collapse it, it would have to straighten it out and bow it the other way. And that just doesn't happen. Now, the other thing uh, to see along the top here uh, is one of the five things that dams in the West are built for. First of all, water storage. Uh, the next is flood control. Uh, the next is um, uh, recreation, which we have an awful lot of it here on uh, what is called uh, Lake Powell. Uh, the uh, next thing is hydroelectric power, which is what these blue boxes are. And the last is irrigation. So we don't have any irrigation here locally. Look at the landscape. There's really no soil. So there's eight uh, control houses with these little kind of robin egg blue things. And um, uh, there are 245 foot down uh, are these large uh, pedstocks, gates they're called. And the gates can be mechanically swung open. And then the water from the lake goes inside there, plummets down at 60 degrees, uh, 400 feet, and turns the turbines. The turbines make the mechanical energy, which is then transformed into electrical energy and sent into the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Western grid, as it's called. Uh, and so if you look in the very bottom center, that's one of the original turbines uh, going back from uh, the original uh, construction back in 63. And uh, now let's look off of uh, Arthur's uh, shoulders there. 
and uh, there is uh, kind of a, a, a difference uh, in the color of the rock. Well, it's all the very, very same rock. We have now gone into lighter or younger rock uh, than we did during the um, uh, Grand Canyon in Sedona. This stuff is uh, from the Jurassic, from the time of the dinosaurs, although uh, this is a Aeolian or a desert windblown environment is and is really not particularly fossiliferous. And so this is known as a Navajo sandstone and is a very, very important rock group on the surface of the American uh, West Rare in Arizona uh, as um, we are just about to get into Utah there. And so um, the, the, the rock is actually the same. So what is it that creates the white? Now all um, lakes and reservoirs in the United States. The difference being a lake is a naturally occurring steel body water reservoir is an empowerment for man's benefit. And so every lake and reservoir in the entire United States is um, characterized uh, by the number of feet above mean sea level that it is at that moment. And this lake here was engineered to be 3,700 foot above sea level. Therefore, um, beginning at 1963, they backed it up and the very top of the white is just about uh, 3,700 feet above sea level. That's what this, this dam was engineered to take. And any of you that live where soft water is, you know what this is. You see the water coming down all the way from the west flank of the Rocky Mountains has minerals in it, primarily calcite or calcium carbonate. And as the water lapped up against the side of the red rock, it just deposited uh, little bits of that uh, calcium carbonate or calcite on it. And so it just kind of gives that little bit of a patina uh, just there. And uh, so the lake now, uh, I don't know if you know this, the American West for 20 years has been in a drought primarily. Even though we've had a couple of wet winters, it hasn't broken a drought. It's just filled up our lakes a little bit. And we are alarmingly uh, low, uh, especially Lake Mead on the other side of the Grand Canyon. We're on the upside of the Grand Canyon here. We're up river of the Colorado. But uh, you're, what you're looking at there, the top of that is 3,609 feet above sea level, meaning it's 91 feet below full pool, you know, or that white line uh, there as you see it. So moving on here, I just happened to just kind of throw this one in. It doesn't take much of an explanation, uh, but the blue here is part of Lake Powell, uh, but it is a auxiliary canyon that used to go into the Colorado River, uh, known as Wauwee Creek, and therefore makes Wauwee Bay. I'm standing on the grounds of uh, what is called Lake Powell Resort, um, and um, just to kind of highlight the vegetation that you see there in the, morning, uh, in the middle there, that is what is called an agave, uh, commonly known as a century plant. Uh, they don't live to be 100 years. Uh, they're growing and trying to reserve as much uh, nutrient as they can in their fairly large root system, but also these large uh, fleshy uh, you know, uh, leaves that they have here. This is not a cactus. It's not a cactus. It is an agave, okay? It's a near yucca uh, plant here. And so uh, one, at one time, uh, uh, this plant uh, that's in the foreground will look like this one because this thing grows up an asparagus-like uh, spear known as an inflorescence in inches a day. And where is it getting all that energy from? It is sucking it all out of its leaves and out of its uh, root system. And as it uh, makes its way up, it goes to flower on these little horizontal uh, pieces here were seams, and then um, as I, I'm fond of saying, it has one glorious but fatal burst of reproduction. So this is virtually dead. Uh, its seed will fly around, there are small seas, etc. Another thing I wanted to highlight is this is a very common kind of a landscaping. Grass is um, hard to grow in the desert where it's so hot and so dry. So there's an awful lot of places uh, that have uh, this kind of uh, rough kind of gravel. It's about half inch, uh, kind of rough, uh, not, not rounded. But then wherever water can flow, we would kind of have these river rocks. And you know, Talc has a great uh, exclusive uh, on the America's Canyonlands. So that is that we get on a, 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 a dinner boat uh, there in Wawweep Creek, go out into the main body of the 
Colorado River there on Lake Powell and, and we have uh, some, uh, some cocktails and then sit down for a beautiful dinner in anticipation of seeing the sunset. Uh, one of the things that makes talc, uh, what who we, who we are for sure. So moving on, uh, uh, the, one of the uh, options, uh, the choices that we have uh, here is be going to what is they call the Navajo uh, Tribal Park. So this is on the Navajo Indian Reservation. Uh, it is not a national park. Uh, it is all part of the largest Indian reservation in the United States, uh, which is 27,400 square miles. This is a huge tract of land, larger than 10 states uh, it is. Uh, and uh, all of the tribal park portion is in Arizona, although the reservation spills out into Utah and New Mexico also. Uh, this is a very popular scene. If you've ever looked at some John Ford movies, uh, I think the marquee one is She Wore a Yellow Ribbon uh, with John Wayne, which show these. Uh, the one on the left is called the West Mitten, the East Mitten, and Merrick Butte there on the right. So I know some of you are going, Boy, I'll tell you what, I've never been able to recognize what is the difference between all of these names here. So a plateau would be a substantial uplift, like the Colorado Plateau. Um, a mesa would be a very large uh, area uh, with normally kind of a flat top. Um, and that flat top would be that cap rock, just like we saw on the top of the uh, Grand Canyon there. Then if uh, you look here on the right at Merrick uh, Butte, if the sides are higher than a top is across, that's the uh, proper pronunciation of a butte, uh, then it would go to like spires and then a little needle and then it all erodes away. The little light line that you see coming out of the bottom left there is part of the scenic drive at 17 miles. Uh, they're on the nation and uh, highlights, uh, obviously this one of a kind worldwide recognizable uh, landscape, which is Monument Valley. Okay, here's Arthur again. And uh, Arthur's enjoying himself uh, here being on the Colorado River. So imagine going through a tunnel, which is reserved only for the Bureau of Reclamation to service the dam. And we go down through the tunnel, an exclusive uh, for, the, uh, for, for at least uh, for this raft right here. And we get on these rafts. Uh, now, the, the naming of that might be a little confusing, but what, these are inflatable pontoons, these light blue things. And then there's kind of like a metal box in the middle uh, where the people's feet are, and then the white cushions without the backs that we, that we sit on. This is not a float trip. There's no oars. You, know, you can see on the back uh, above where it reads Colorado, it reads uh, is, is an, an outboard motor. It kind of takes us these 15 and a half, 15.2 miles from the base of the dam down the last of the Glen Canyon uh, down to Lee's Ferry, the very famous place. Now, this is our friend, the Navajo Sandstone, the same thing I introduced to you a little bit earlier. And something of interest is this dark piece right here in the middle. Uh, this is what is known as desert varnish. And desert varnish uh, is an accumulation, a topical accumulation of manganese dioxide, which is very, very dark. Uh, and iron oxide uh, that leaches out of the rock and then is um, actually mechanically and biologically bound to the surface of the rock. Well, hundreds of years ago, in lieu of an alphabet, the people that had lived here would etch with a harder rock into this what is called desert varnish and make what are called petroglyphs. So we call this petroglyph beach. And uh, that's where all the guests are. They're walking up to the petroglyphs. And that is also our only place uh, on the trip that we have summer rooms. And I don't know if you're familiar with that term. If you've ever been with Don Dunkel in years past, uh, for over 30 years, uh, I have been calling uh, summer rooms, uh, which is summer for men and summer for women, otherwise uh, known as the uh, toilets. We know what happens there and what we do there. So I'm just waiting for the guests to kind of come on back, just Arthur hanging with. Uh, with me along the Colorado River. Uh, now, if you need to get up and move around for about two minutes, you could probably uh, uh, do uh, without this in the next slide. Uh, but otherwise, if you hang in there with me, this is an incredible view here for sure. Arthur's certainly enjoying it. And this is what is known as a balanced rock. Uh, it's known as a pedestal rock. It's known as a, um, a mushroom rock, you know, for because it looks like a mushroom. This gives us a great uh, possibility to investigate uh, what is known as variable erosion. 
what we have here, we have two different distinct rock groups. One is going right across Arthur Sr.'s shoulders here, and this is what is known as a Shinarump conglomerate. Shinna is a Paiute Indian word meaning wolf, and um, rump uh, means bum, so wolf bum. And if we look closely at it, they're little rounded bits you know, round like a, like a butt would be, so to speak. And this has really good binding material, so it's a relatively hard sedimentary rock. Now, the kind of the dark uh, reddish rock uh, below is called the Muenkopi Formation. This was late 225 million years ago when North America was the edge of Pangaea, right as Pangaea began to break up. Where I am standing right now with Arthur is the west side of Pangaea, which is pretty fascinating for sure. And when um, the, the landscape here is not only lowering, but it's also moving away from us into that cliff, because this red stuff here, uh, the moon copy is softer, it undercuts the harder Shinarump conglomerate. And you can see how it kind of falls down here uh, in, in large pieces. Well, when this thing in here fell down, right there at that constricted area was the ground level. And since that fell, not only is it rounded off the top, but also it has protected the softer underlying features, and that's what gives us that, the pedestal rock. Uh, the, um, and so, um, you know what, my screen, I can't quite see, oops, uh, here, but there, I don't know if you were able to see, there were three people standing right off to the side. I think my face might be over it. Uh, but if it's not, there were three people. What I liked about that and why I chose this particular photo is here's three people looking at their iPad uh, at the photo of the thing that they're just standing in front of, okay? And this is a very common consequence of uh, digital photography. Now, I get a little weepy when I look at this particular photo, and you might uh, there also. Uh, if you are uh, the great patron, like I'm a patron myself, I just happen to work for them here. I even got a talc shirt <coughs> uh, to show that. But uh, look at that. It says how the world matters, how you see the world matters. And then it says talc, you know. And so these are uh, found throughout the world uh, with certain of our suppliers, uh, with, the, with the bus companies and all that. And this was actually taken where the last photo was. This is the balanced rocks and how you see the world matters. Uh, it goes uh, beyond how you see your life, but uh, it's kind of like a creed uh, that we uh, in Talc um, uh, enjoy. So let's just give it five seconds of silence as we enjoy the photo. Okay. All right, oh, there's Arthur Sr. You see the previous slide, that's comfort folks. It's air conditioned, we have pit television monitors, it's got a summer room in the back, nice seats, great drivers. Shout out to one of the two best drivers I've ever had in my life, Roger Champagne. Uh, and that is the modern way that talk travels. This is the way we used to. No, I'm kidding. It, it, but this is kind of like a wagon. I just put this in here to imply, it, 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 to read the history of the American West, that people would leave whatever security and comfort they had in the East to put their families and, and risk their futures uh, to come to the West for other opportunities is something that uh, we should all revere as part of the uh, American program for sure. And Arthur certainly told me that. He told me just that for sure. Now, now we moved on. There's Arthur. He's enjoying himself. He's up there at 8,000 feet above sea level. And this is all still on the Colorado Plateau uh, there. And he's at um, what is called Bryce Point. And um, at Bryce Point, um, we call this a uh, little nomenclature. I see I'm running out of time already. I'll try to hurry this through, but this is called Bryce Canyon National Park. Okay, Ebenezer Bryce was an early settler. He was a Mormon. He and his wife, uh, Mary, they, they were settled down in Low Point here. And he used to run some cattle up in, into there. He left in 1875. But uh, he used to, because of, uh, he used to spend time up there. People called it Bryce's Canyon. Um, and uh, so he left us with a legacy of a very particular phrase. He was quoted as saying, hell of a place to lose a cow. And you're going to see just how that is. In addition to that, it's not a canyon. A canyon has two sides. This is more of what is called a break. 
you see uh, it is eroded from where we're standing forward to make uh, Bryce Canyon. And it's also a national park, a national park under the Department of Interior. And even though there are 419 different uh, entries into it, most of them are monuments, which can be acknowledged by a president. There are only 62 national parks, of which uh, Alaska has uh, eight, uh, California has nine. There are five here, four in Colorado. So that's a big bulk of it, just in those four states there. And a national park has to be recognized by the United States Congress. And I'm very thrilled to say the last entry into the national park was the former national monument uh, called White Sands, the largest gypsum sand desert uh, in the world in southwestern uh, New Mexico. Now, Bryce Canyon has a, a real eye appeal. Uh, this is uh, Bryce Canyon, and uh, these are classified as what is called hoodoos. And uh, this uh, landscape across the horizon is passively eroding back away from us. And how these things formed uh, is primarily uh, from erosion uh, of water, uh, surprisingly. And see, the water comes down into what are called gullies. If you can follow my cursor, you can see like little V cuts into the terrain. Here's one down towards the bottom right. And as the water comes off of where we are standing, it, cre it creates these really deep gullies uh, once it erodes down into this level. And uh, so these are known as primary walls. I can see one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. And, and between the primary walls, um, uh, once they're established, then other erosional and weathering activities begin to isolate these individual things, which are called hoodoos. And if the rock was, um, you know, homogenous, it wouldn't happen. It's the fact that when you see these little sedimentary lines, uh, some of them are kind of harder and softer than others. Some of them are just hard cap rocks. Now, this is the youngest rock outside of latent volcanics that we're going to see here. Uh, this only began to form uh, as a featureless lake uh, 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 surrounded by higher mountains when the Colorado Plateau first lifted up. And all this material coming down, all this water created a large playa, accumulated. I'm, I'm giving you the skinny on it here. And then it was compressed. And only 15 million years ago, there was a secondary uplift of the Colorado Plateau. And uh, that's when this became the high elevation, which is now eroding away, creating that. And any of you fortunate enough to have been to Bryce Canyon uh, may know of this next one. This is called Thor's Hammer. This is the most famous rock in a park full of rocks. As a matter of fact, this was the cover girl, cover, excuse me, the cover, I'm sorry, the cover of, a, um, uh, of the geology of the National Parks of Utah a couple of years ago. And kind of really, I uh, wanted, I just wanted to show you that this cap rock again, protects the softer underlying features. The word hoodoo comes from the African voodoo, meaning anything that is evil because we have these kind of grotesque kind of pillars that can have almost human looks to them. So uh, Bryce is a great destination. When we talk about Bryce and Zion, Bryce and Zion go together like peanut butter and jelly, Laurel and Hardy. Well, those, those aren't the same and neither is Zion. Oh, here's Arthur Sr. He, he's enjoying Zion. And we have now made our way into the canyon and so now we're down below looking up as opposed to being up at the Grand Canyon looking down, uh, being at um, Bryce up looking down. Here's our third national park. And the way we got in here is a 1.1 mile tunnel that is through this dark line up there in the top right. To give you a feeling of scale, this arch is 720 foot across and 90 foot deep. That's twice as deep as our bus is long. And as he's kind of looking around Pine Valley Canyon, this was really done by the activity of water. Water coming down has eroded, made it deeper, made it wider. And uh, vegetation uh, is pretty classic. Uh, we have uh, over here, we have some scrub oak. And unfortunately, right out of the feature there is why Arthur's standing at this particular place, because there's mistletoe. And who doesn't like a mistletoe? You don't have to be at Christmas time or the holidays only. So Arthur's loving it. Uh, here's another look at Zion. This was taken in the autumn uh, with my good friend Dub. And the reason I know that is because uh, the box elder uh, leaves are kind of falling off and there's just a remnant of a couple of seeds there. Uh, these are great landscapes. Uh, again, this is our friend, the Navajo sandstone. Uh, and we find that there's the Tower of the Virgin, the West Temple, 
uh, an awful lot of just um, great uh, kind of uh, names here. Uh, the uh, altar of sacrifice is this one in the middle. What I find really interesting, and I'm going to have to go through this, uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, and that is that right here uh, is how the, the, this whole uh, desert stopped. This thing was going on for millions of years. This was bigger than Montana. This was an immense uh, kind of a, a, a desert here. This sand came from the degradation of the ancient Appalachian Mountains. So that's our first westward migration, I guess. And so after millions of years of desert, here we have uh, some sloppy mud uh, coming down from the Utah Idaho trough <laughs> and just bellowed off the entire desert and gave us this red zone. And see, that's what this red kind of pouring down off of it uh, is uh, there, and it's called the Temple Cat. Uh, cap formation, or just a respite from the uh, desert uh, conditions. Okay, I'm going to get through these next couple in a hurry. And there is Arthur, senior, Arthur Talk Sr. And uh, he is enjoying the marquee destination all the way in the very far end of the road at what is called the Temple of Sinawava. Sinawava being the Paiute Indian god, uh, their wolf god, their benevolent um, uh, god. Uh, so we take some of the good, uh, you know, good, good, good goodness of, of Sinawaba home with us when we partake of the canyon there. And he's kind of walking in one mile up to the Narrows and then kind of walking out, uh, but, you, but really loving it here for sure. And uh, so uh, then uh, why is it that we can be in Sedona? We can be in the Grand Canyon. We can be in... Uh, Lake Powell, a national, a, a national record, uh, national, uh, rec, um, uh, uh, Lake Powell and Bryson Zion National Parks. Uh, and uh, why is it that we end in Las Vegas? Well, the reason being uh, is that you cannot get a direct flight from Kanab, Utah uh, to, um, you know, to, to Newark. You know, you have to be able to fly in and fly out. So it's just a mere 158 miles. We pick up a, a, an hour as we change time zones. And uh, the gold uh, kind of building there in the back uh, is Mandalay Bay. And uh, the Tauk Tour stays in another four seasons. We have our own entrance into this 424-room uh, non-gaming hotel uh, on the 35th, 39th floor. And uh, so uh, with that, um, I just think it would be appropriate uh, to just kind of say something about uh, Arthur Tauk Jr. And uh, he is the commander. He's at the helm of this fleet uh, that we call Tauk. Uh, I'm part of the crew and I give him my utmost uh, respect uh, for what he has done as this great travel uh, visionary and innovator. Uh, now I'm gonna just put this uh, next screen up here. And um, you may be interested in this, uh, Dave. I don't know if you can center this so that they can see those last couple of words or more. Uh, but this is uh, just a, a bit of, of um, uh, additional reading, if you would like. Um, I believe Kelly says she has some way to make that available. Uh uh, I to will you. make that, uh, yes, I can yep. make it available on Inside Talk at talk.com if anybody wants to email that. And Don, we do have a couple questions here. So um, one slide that you put up for us was in a Zion photo in the fall. So it kind of brings to mind, what's the best time of year to do this trip? Um, I'd say, oh, the, the Canyonlands trip or to be in Zion? I would, uh, the Canyonlands trip. Oh, okay. I would say anywhere from the first departure to the last. Uh, so we operate um, uh, in, in mid-April, and the reason why is that we have three different places that we scale high elevations, and those high elevations of the Grand Canyon, North Kaibab Plateau, and Bryce can all lend itself to uh, snowstorms uh, earlier than mid-April. And so we do it until then, and um, then uh, the last one um, ends probably about the 20th to 25th of October. Uh, so the advantage of uh, going in the shoulder seasons, you know, April or October, um, is um, a little cooler weather, but they're shorter days. And I myself like the longer days because there are later sunsets. 
there's more daylight in the morning to take a little bit of a walk. And that's the value of being in these places. And this is not getting on the bus and taking photo stops. It's really being able to enjoy a little bit on your own. And, and so I like the middle of the summer for that reason. And the thing about it is talk will always have your hotel room. We'll always have your dinner reservation. They'll always get your luggage to your room. They got a beautiful choreography. And I just kind of might say in closing, uh, thank you for the uh, segue there. I see a tour very much like a wine tasting party. And that is you go and you take a little sip of this and you take a sip of that. And if you really like something, you go buy the bottle. Okay, so it's the same thing with the talk tour. You, you go take it and, and, and this is not meant to be an in-depth investigation. This is a, a, a sip. This is a sip of an incredible landscape. It will give you an introduction. It will give you a memory that you'll last forever and maybe entice you to come back uh, a little bit more leisurely at another day on your own, in your own manner. Okay, next question. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we offer a Monument Valley sightseeing option. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, uh, as far as the Monument Valley option, uh, if you were to uh, uh, pour through uh, what we offer as a company, uh, very rarely do we have options where there's an add-on price. We are an all-inclusive company uh, here, uh, but uh, this one uh, has an advantage to give uh, the guests some creativity. So in the morning of day number four of the American Canyonlands Tour, we do a scenic flight. But if people pay an additional amount, I'll let you go online to see that. I'm not a travel agent here, I know what it is, but uh, then uh, and they will take an, a flight that goes out to Monument Valley, lands at, at the local airport, is met by a Navajo guide on a Navajo bus through the Navajo Tribal Park, and will take you down, not through the entire 17 miles, but an opportunity to take a couple hundred photos of Monument Valley. So yes, uh, it is a option, and if not to do it, then there's the shorter included flight over the landscape of Lake Powell. Thank you. We can go um, over. I, I can I can handle a few more questions if anybody. Yeah, I've got I've got another one here for you. Uh, you alluded at the very beginning to the Canadian Rockies. So, I mean, in your own opinion, uh, what do you think the big difference is between the Canadian Rockies and the Rockies in the U.S.? Uh, geology. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a there is a there is a, there's a great difference uh, here. But one thing that they do have in common, they're all part of the Laramide orogeny. They're all from the subduction of the Pacific plate that crashed into the North American plate, creating some compression. And as it dove underneath, it forced things up, like the Sierra Nevadas and the you know, Colorado Plateau, the American Rockies and the Canadian Rockies. Uh, vegetation kind of uh, changes because we're, uh, the American Rockies are lower in latitude. Uh, also, an awful lot of different rock groups that are not as consistent. But uh, what is interesting, uh, thank you for bringing that up, uh, is that you know I alighted to the fact that uh, there are no uh, Ordovician uh, or Silurian rocks uh, in the uh, one photo that I showed you, the Canadian Rockies. Guess what? There are no Ordovician or Silurian rocks in the Grand Canyon. That entire strip of, of North America was devoid of accumulation. Uh, during that time. Okay, next. Um, so I think that's all we have time for, Don. Okay, great. And I want to thank everybody today for joining us. Um, again, if you have burning questions that we didn't get to, please email insidetalk at talk.com. And of course, we have an amazing group of people. Our reservation sales counselors are available Monday through Friday, and they can help answer any questions that you have regarding touring um, and uh, our upcoming operations. So thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Bye.